Well, the modern message in the contemporary church, that is the message that the God of love only wants his children to have a smooth ride in this life, that your best life is now, that, that, that message that would say to us that if you just have enough faith, you can experience uninterrupted health and untold wealth. That message may say is very appealing to us. But tell that message to the hundred million Christians in the world today who are facing persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. Tell that very message to the people who are now this morning being disowned by their families, who are experiencing horrible torture as we sit here in our comfort. Tell that message to people who this morning are in prison and they would say that message is a lie. It is not true. But the fact is, millions of Christians around the world this morning are facing persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. Some reports suggest that there is one Christian martyred in our world every five minutes. How hollow, how foreign is this modern message of Christianity to thousands of spouses and families and churches around the world this morning where loved ones, husbands maybe, uh, dads maybe, mums maybe, pastors are, are, are facing their death this very morning because they are Christians. Jesus told it as it is. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are you when they persecute you, he said. You see, right from the get-go of the ministry of Jesus, he was not trying to hide anything. There, there was no small print in the contract. Jesus told his hearers in this greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, exactly what it would be if they followed him. So this morning we're coming to what is the eighth and the final beatitude. It's been several weeks. Do you remember what the beatitudes are? The beatitudes are a list of eight characteristics of a true Christian. They're not eight different types of Christians, but they, we could call them eight qualities that are evident to some degree in every truly saved sinner. Or we could call them eight birthmarks of someone who is born again. This, this list here from verses 3 down through to verse 10 or even into 12, this is not multi-choice. You can't pick and choose here. You know, like take a couple you like and leave the rest out. I'll take A, I'll take B, but I'll just I'll leave the last one. I mean, I don't mind the, the blessed are the, the merciful. I don't mind blessed are the peacemakers, but I, I'll just skip on blessed are the persecuted. No, all eight of these are all manifest in the life of a true citizen in God's kingdom. A true Christian will have each of these birthmarks to some degree. The birthmark in some of these may be smaller or larger, but the birthmark will be there of someone who is truly born again. And we're going to consider then this last one, this eighth one this morning. It, it's more than, we've got more information here than the previous seven. The, the previous seven, we have one verse each, but, but this one, it spills over into effectively three verses. Verses 10 through to 12, that's what we're going to seek to cover this morning as we think about the persecuted under three major headings. We'll look at the certainty of persecution, the cause of persecution and the crown of persecution. All three of those things are found in these verses. I hope you can see them with me. Let's look then firstly to find the certainty of persecution. You see, Jesus doesn't hesitate. Jesus doesn't give an, a, 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 some sort of 
apology here. Jesus just simply states very clearly that persecution is going to be part and parcel of true Christianity. He says in verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted. Again he repeats himself in verse 11, Blessed are you when they revile and they persecute you. So he's saying if we follow Christ, remember what that means in terms of the Beatitudes, if we are someone who is poor in spirit, that is we know that we are absolutely bankrupt and empty before God in our hearts, if we are someone who mourns over our sin, if we are truly humble and meek, if we hunger after righteousness, if we are merciful, if we are pure in heart, if we are pursuing peace with all men, then he says we will, we will be persecuted. If you're hoping to get through life unscathed as a Christian, then you're following the wrong Christ. But what Jesus says here, he repeats with even greater clarity as his ministry unfolds. In the book of Matthew still, but come with me over a couple of chapters to see what else Jesus goes on to say in chapter 10. He says in verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, Therefore be wise as servants and harmless as doves. But beware of men. for They will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues and so on. If you drop down to verse 22, in the same chapter he says, But you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Doesn't exactly sound like your best life now. Does it? If you come over with me to the Gospel of John, because in John chapter 15, Jesus elaborates this with even more clarity right toward the end of his uh, ministry and his life. In the upper room discourse, just before he would go to Gethsemane, the, the, the night before he would die, he says this in John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, You know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute me. You. Again, if we just go over to chapter 16, in verse 33, he says, In the world you will have tribulation. That's a promise. Now, don't we love Bible promises? Well, here's a promise to put on your fridge. In the world you will have tribulation. It's a promise. Now obviously not every moment of every day in the Christian's life is the Christian going to experience persecution for their faith. Solomon acknowledged in Ecclesiastes 3, in everything, in, 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 in everything there is a season. And he lists a whole lot of things and, and one of the things he says right at the end of that list, there's a time for war and there is a time for peace. And so there are seasons of peace. But there are likewise also times and there are places in the world that are more difficult and more dangerous for the Christian than others. We know this. Some families. Some workplaces. Some friends. Are more hostile to Christians than others. But if you have never known opposition to your Christian faith, then there is something very wrong. You see, Jesus is addressing the certainty of persecution. 
But he also gives specifics of what it will look like. So if we come back to Matthew chapter 5, what does Jesus specifically say that the persecution will look like that is certain to come for the true believer? Well, the very base level of understanding from the words he uses in verse 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted. That, that word in the Greek is used, or at least the same root word, is used again in verse 11 where he says, blessed are you when they revile and they persecute you. That, that word has the idea, the word persecute has the idea to pursue, to chase, to drive out. Think about it. That's what Saul of Tarsus did, wasn't it? Before he got converted. That's what he did toward the Christians. He chased them. He was driving them out. And so what Jesus is speaking about here by way of this word persecuting, this is, this is personal. This is like personal attacks and it can indeed be physical. Jesus therefore is saying that, that, that they, as he speaks to his true followers, they will drive you out of your families perhaps, they will drive you out of your jobs, they will drive you out of your homes, out of your churches, away from your friends. This is a persecution where they will seek to run you out of town. Personal. In verse 11, he says, Blessed are you when they persecute you. If you remain loyal to Christ, friendship sooner or later will be withdrawn. You may be isolated. You may be passed over, maybe for a promotion in the workplace. You, you may be written off by your family. You, you, you may have popularity at one point in your life and then it will diminish when people realise you're a Christian. The certainty of personal persecution for the child of God who is loyal to Jesus. You think about this as it worked itself out in the book of Acts as it worked itself out in the first century. In those early days for the church, the price that was paid was often ultimate. To choose Christ in that culture, to follow him faithfully, would, would mean that you may even be choosing death by stoning or being covered in pitch, tar, and then used as a human torch in Nero's garden. Or for those Christians in the early century to, to be taken and, and, and to be wrapped up in animal skins and then be thrown into the hungry hunting dog. Today we hear horrific stories of Christians, professing Christians being beheaded by swords by Muslim terrorists in our world. Horrific. And though the depth of persecution severity may, may not be our current experience here, we are beginning to see the threatening clouds building on the horizon of our nation in a way that the history of our nation since European settlement has never known. The rapid and dark changes that we are witnessing in our culture just over the last year or two. Right now, the Victorian government is looking at changing the law with religious freedom. Their Premier, Daniel Andrews, is, is wanting to remove the current restrictions so that, the, that, that schools or organisations, churches are no longer free to only employ people of their beliefs. It's been talked about for a while but now there's deliberate steps to make it law in Victoria. Dark clouds are growing. Those of you who have been around long enough will often have seen this. What often happens in Victoria spills over into New South Wales and before long it comes into Queensland. Perhaps the reality of this is within a few short years, within a decade, my grandson will be visiting me in prison. That, that is where we are going. Personal physical attacks, the literal pursuing and the literal driving out 
driving preachers out of their pulpits, out of their churches, just like happened to John Bunyan. Driving faithful Christians from their homes and faithful Christians from their places of employment because they will not compromise according to the righteous standards of the Lord Jesus. And so there will be, Jesus says, personal attack. But there's also something else he mentions in verse 11 because he goes on to elaborate it in verse 11 when he says, Blessed are you when they revile you. So not just personal, physical attack, but now he's speaking about verbal, verbal attack, as it were. Verbal abuse, really. To revile, that word means to receive a verbal blow. The very word is used later in Matthew in chapter 27 and verse 44 when our Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross. He was reviled. He was verbally abused as he hung on the cross. And Jesus is saying, this is going to happen to to my true followers. They will be verbally abused as well. And again, friends, we're already seeing this ramp up in our culture with the whole homosexual and gender debate. Anyone standing for truth and biblical marriage, anyone standing for God's uh, created distinction of male and female are labelled already. They get, they get labelled, they get verbal abuse thrown at them. They're bigots. They're homophobes. There's a growing intolerance to Bible-believing Christians. It's bizarre because it's within the context of a host of weird religions being accepted. And the broad embrace of Islam. True Christians are more and more being labelled the dangerous fundamentalists. And so true Christians can expect, Jesus has already said this, they can, we can expect verbal abuse and that can come in relation to our character, it can come in relation to our beliefs, it can come in relation even to our motives. You see how this is just so relevant for us? But Jesus mentions another aspect of persecution uh, when he says in verse 11, he goes on to say something else about this thing being verbal. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Then he says, and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely. And so it's not just personal and physical attack. It's, It's not just verbal abuse thrown at you, but this is verbal in terms of slander. That's the idea that Jesus is referring to, that, you know, Jesus is saying people will make things up about you. Or they will exaggerate your words or exaggerate the position that you are taking on an issue or whatever. They will misrepresent you. That's what Jesus is saying. They're going to assign false motives to you. They're going to draw wrong conclusions about you and they're going to spread it about in conversation. They may do it over the phone, they may do it over the internet. Jesus is saying that they may smile in your fa- at your face. And while they do, they'll stab you in the back. Of course, we, sh- we shouldn't be surprised because we have an enemy and his name, Devil, one of the names given to him in the Bible. The word devil, the name devil, has a meaning and it literally means slanderer. Our enemy loves to use false accusations to try and bring down a Christian's witness, to bring down a a pastor's ministry or a church's testimony. You read Revelation chapter 12, we won't look at it, but you read Revelation chapter 12 and you see that this is the devil's activity day and night and he knows that his time is short, it says. So in other words, he's ramping it up because he knows that Christ is coming back soon. So never doubt, never doubt who's behind false accusations even when it may come from the lips or the pen or the iPad of a a professed believer. The devil's got his grubby mitts all over that thing. So what do we see in the first place just in the very 
front end of all of this, the certainty of persecution for the true followers of Christ. But secondly, Jesus really helps us because he highlights what I'm calling the cause of persecution. And this is helpful because at this point we need to make something clear. Jesus is not just saying that all persecution is is, is good and, and right for Christians. Because some persecution, some opposition can come about because Christians act foolishly or they act insensitively and it causes an offence or it brings a response, if you like, that in some ways is a justified response. We may act harshly. We may have a contentious, argumentative spirit and that provokes other people. And so some opposition comes about, zealous Christians maybe, and they're bashing people with their Bible almost. Or they meddle with things that are none of their business. And the Apostle Peter addresses this. Let's turn to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Because the Christians were, were being harassed in, in Peter's day. They were suffering. And so Peter addresses this whole theme of suffering in his first epistle in 1 Peter 4 and he makes a distinction between those who are suffering in the right way and those who are suffering or could be suffering for wrong reasons. 1 Peter 4 verse 14 he says If you are reproached or reviled or insulted, if you are reproached for the name of Christ... Blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this matter. And so there is a way in which we as true Christians can glorify God in the midst of our suffering, he is saying. But make sure that your suffering is not because of your foolishness or your godlessness even. Now the big picture is Christians are very different from non-Christians. We are of a different race. We have a different master. We have a different destiny. We have different standards. We are very, very different. Not because of us, but because of the grace of God within us. And you think about it, we have a message that the world doesn't exactly get excited about, does it? The world does not want to hear about an almighty God who is holy, who is ruler over all things, including them. That he owns you because he made you. And therefore, you are responsible to him. That the world does does not want to hear that we are all sinful, that we are weak, and that we are wicked, and that we deserve his wrath. They don't want to hear that. They don't don't want to hear that Jesus is coming back again to judge the world and that all of this world is going to be burnt up, including your favourite toy. It's a very unwelcome message, the Christian message. The passengers on the Titanic, when they were no doubt enjoying their sumptuous meal in that lavishly decorated dining room and when they were dancing to the, the beautiful music of the orchestra, They would not have wanted someone to come into that situation and announce this boat is going to sink. And they especially wouldn't want that person to stand up and say and it's going to sink because of you. That that would not exactly have been a kindly received message if that would be given. The Christian message is an unwelcomed message. We have a different message to the world. And so as Christians we are different. Our very existence is unwelcomed 
because Christ's likeness, Christ formed within us by the grace of God, that is offensive to the world. And that's really the point that I think Jesus is, is driving at here, especially in this first part. Look at his specific words back in verse 10. The cause of persecution. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for what? For righteousness' sake. Righteousness' sake. Living for righteousness. Or righteous living by the grace of God. That will invoke persecution from the world. Being part of a godly family is basically saying to your neighbours they should be acting the same. Working diligently for the boss. Not joining in on the dirty jokes at work or in the, in, in the, in the playground or the classroom. That stands out for all to see. Our very existence is a reproach to the world. And that's why righteousness it invites, as it were, persecution. That's what Jesus says. For righteousness' sake. Christianity was never designed by our Lord to just sort of blend in with the world. You know, like as if there's hardly any difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. That's not biblical Christianity. Christianity wasn't designed to be like that. And, and we can never make the true gospel trendy. No, that's a huge error by the modern church. You see, we need to get our head around this and think about this honestly. Unless God comes in mighty power in revival and then he, he converts the world anyway, <laughs> But to think that we can make this church such a wonderful place that everyone in this community will love to come. If that would happen, we would have ceased to be the true church of Jesus Christ. Christians are going to be persecuted. Why? Because of righteousness. And the world does not want righteousness because it exposes their sin and their consciences are moved. But Jesus also says in verse 11, there's another cause. He goes on to say, well, it's more specific, really, is what he's saying in verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. For what? What's the cause? For my sake. Now, most often the persecution that comes to Christians, if you think about it biblically and even historically, most often it comes worse from religious people, not the world. Right back to the very first generation, Abel. He's the first martyr for his faith. He suffered. He was persecuted. Why? Because of righteousness, what 1 John chapter 3 says. Cain was of the devil, 1 John 3 says. Abel practiced righteousness and that's why he was murdered. And it was all in the context of worship. In the context of religion. But just think about Jesus himself. We can go to lots of other examples, but Jesus himself. I mean, who stirred up the mob before Pilate? It wasn't the Roman soldiers, it wasn't the world, it was the religious Jews, the leaders, who hassled Paul, the apostle, in his missionary journeys, who ran him out of town. It was the Jews, the self-righteous Jews. And so in church history, right down to this day, the most severe persecution often comes from self-righteous religious people and they often use slander. They often use words. And yet Jesus is telling us at the end of the day it actually boils down to opposition to Jesus Christ. Because that's the connection he makes in verse 11 when false things are said against Christians for my sake. 
It always comes to true Christians because of Christ in the end. Because Christians are identified with Christ. Christians means like little Christs. So our Lord drives his point home here, I believe, with simple clarity. The cause, in the end of the day, of Christian persecution, of true of persecution to true Christians for my sake. Not just because of what you believe, not just because of the message preached, but ultimately because of me, Jesus says. If you have stepped out of the crowd and if you have publicly identified yourself with Jesus Christ, therefore you will be persecuted. We already read it. John 15, a servant is not, a, not, not above his master. If they persecuted you, they will persecute, sorry, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If the world hates you, you can know that they hated me before they hated you. It's persecution because of Jesus. So what then is the deal? But what then is, is the deal if someone professes to be Christian but they're not blessed? What's that say? Well, perhaps you're not a Christian at all. Maybe you're just a church girl. Perhaps you're just a religious person. And God has never saved you. He hasn't made you different to the world. You don't have this birthmark. You haven't had the other seven that we've looked at in recent weeks. Or maybe you are saved. But you've been compromising. You've been trying to blend in with the world. You've been trying to keep your head down. You know, we use that phrase, don't we? Sort of taken from the First World War of the men in the, in the trenches. The safe place was, you don't pop your head up, you get it knocked off. So you keep your head down. You don't want to be seen. You want to hide. You want to stay in the trenches. Maybe you've been holding back from publicly declaring your faith in Jesus and it's caused you to compromise more and more because you've failed to do what God calls you to do. You you haven't made a clear break and a clear profession. Jesus says, He who is ashamed of me and my words, with him, the Son of Man, when he comes in all of his glory, he too will be ashamed of me. Maybe it simply is that you need to repent and that you need to return to your first love and you need to think back to those early days as a Christian when you were zealous for Jesus. But you cared more for Jesus' name and, and you loved souls more. That was more in, important to you than your peace, your safety and your comfort. Some years ago, I... In the period of communist Russia, there was an underground church meeting in a secret warehouse. In the middle of their service, uh, uh, the pastor was preaching and as he was preaching to these people there who were meeting in in secret, who were hiding from the forces, the, the, the back doors swung open. And in came the Russian troops. And one of the officers came to the front and he said, everyone who is not a Christian, you need to leave right now because we will deal with the Christians after you leave. And in that moment, half the congregation got out and left that gathering. Then the officer said, lock the doors. And they did. And then he said, We wanted to find out who all the true Christians are. We have become believers in Jesus Christ and we do not want to worship with pretenders. I wonder what it would be for you this morning if some lone wolf ISIS terrorist responds to the call that went out earlier last week 
and comes in here with guns and explosives and comes to the front with guns pointing toward you and says, everyone who is not a Christian must leave right now. The real Christians, they must remain. We're going to deal with you. How many of us would remain? How many of us would leave? Half of us? What would you do? The gun is pointed to you. Are you a Christian? Or you're not a Christian? If you're not a Christian, you can live. If you're a Christian, you're going to die right now. Would you leave? Do you know anything of what Jesus is speaking about in this passage? Being persecuted for righteousness sake? Being persecuted for Jesus' sake? You say, oh boy, this is a bit hot for me. Is this really what Christianity is like? Let's look at the third point because this is where it's glorious. Number three, the crown of persecution. The crown. You see, here's why. Here's why, friends. Jesus can say in verse 10, Blessed, perfectly happy are those who are persecuted. Yeah, there's a sense in which Jesus is, res- is reserving, right to the end of this list of these Beatitudes, he's reserving a double blessing for those persecuted for Christ. Because he repeats himself. In verse 10 he says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And then in verse 11 he says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Twice. It's a double blessing, we can say. What makes... Persecuted Christians, bless. And how do we get our head around the first part of verse 12? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You know, Jesus is actually giving a command here. It's in the imperative mood, in the language of the Greek, which is telling us, Jesus is saying, you must, if you are my follower, You must respond to persecution this way. You must. I command you to. Rejoice. And then he ramps it up because he says then, yeah, a bit more, be exceedingly glad. (laughs) That literally means to, to skip and to jump with happy excitement. Are you with this? You know, like, yippee! I'm getting persecuted for my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to jump about and skip with excitement. How do we understand what Jesus is saying here? Like all the other Beatitudes, not only is this cultural, counter-cultural, it's counter our hearts. Well, Jesus gives three things and I'm just going to give them to you quickly as we finish. Three things that that help us to see why it is we can obey the command to rejoice and to skip about in gladness when we are being persecuted for our faith. Jesus tells us to look in three different directions. Number one, look at your citizenship. Verse 10. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds... Sorry, I'm reading verse 11. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake for, here's the reason they're blessed, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're part of God's kingdom. They are citizens in the kingdom of heaven. Their citizenship is not on this earth. It's not in this world. Their citizenship, he says, is in heaven. Now, in each of these Beatitudes, Jesus has highlighted, and I've underscored the pronoun thing, remember? 
He says, for theirs. For theirs is something. For theirs is, it's an emphatic pronoun. That is saying, it's theirs and it's theirs alone. In other words, the only ones who are going to go to heaven are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, who, who faithfully follow the Lord Jesus on earth. It's simple, just like that. No one else can. If you are not getting persecuted for righteousness sake, persecuted because you have faith and you follow the Lord Jesus, then you are not going to heaven. Full stop. Theirs and theirs only is the kingdom. They and they only are citizens in the kingdom of heaven. And so can you get the deduction? I underscore it, I highlight it, I get the red pen out so you don't miss it. If you know nothing of this persecution that we're considering this morning, you are not going to heaven. But the opposite is also true. And that's the main point of this passage. If it is, you do know and you have, and you are experiencing at least to some degree, even if it's the small birthmark, you've got it. You can rejoice. This is why our old friend, Billy Bray, this is why he could say, well, they can put me in a barrel, but I will still shout out the bunghole, Hallelujah! His was the kingdom. And this is why when Mrs. Bray on her deathbed dies, what does he do by way of response? He dances about her bed and he sings, she is done with the doubters and she's gone to the showers because hers was the kingdom of heaven. You can rejoice. You can skip with joy and excitement, Jesus said, because you have a citizenship in heaven. And at the end of the day, that's why the world persecutes you because their citizenship is on this earth and you belong to a different place. The sense in which, yes, you are on another planet. You can rejoice because persecution helps you to know who you are. It helps to highlight that your citizenship is not here. That your citizenship is somewhere, somewhere else and so persecution is a good thing because it helps with assurance of faith. Look at your citizenship. Number two, look at your company. Who are you rubbing shoulders with? Jesus tells us at the end of verse 12, For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Think of this. You feel so small in your Christian faith and so inept and so weak. Think about the company that you're keeping in Christ. As a Christian, the prophets before had a faith in the Christ to come and they, were su- they, they suffered because their citizenship was in heaven. You're a fellow citizen with profit. You are in a, a privileged company, all right. You're in the company of Elijah who was harassed by Jezebel because of his faithfulness. You're in the company of Jeremiah who was down in the mire in the world because of his faithfulness to Christ for the Christ to come. You're in the company of Isaiah who tradition tells us he was that one spoken about at the end of Hebrews 11 who was sawn in two by the Jews. Rejoice, friend. You're rubbing soldiers with the prophets in your experience as bitter as it may taste at times. You can rejoice and skip about to see who you are linking arms with. Look at your citizenship. Look at your company. Now finally as we end, look at your future. First part of verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Here's the reason. For great is your reward in heaven. Yes, times of persecution and opposition can indeed be very tough. But even in the midst of those tough times, there is still room to rejoice. 
Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, for our light afflictions which are but for a moment are working for us a far more weighty and exceeding weight of glory. And so Jesus is saying, look at your glorious future. That's how you can rejoice. Don't don't be looking at your enemies. Don't be looking at all the, the hurt and the pain. Look up and look at what is to come. God reserves a great reward for you. Persecution is telling the Christian, I don't belong here. This ain't my home. My home is somewhere else. Persecution will wean us from the world that your permanent address is pearly gates, number seven, Golden Street. Wonderful. You see, my perspective as a Christian on what happens to me in this world must be governed by where I'm going. For me personally, 87 Faguna Hakesley Road, Faguna, Queensland is not my permanent address. I'm going to heaven to receive my, my rich and great and gracious reward. One of those early faithful men in the early centuries, in the 4th century actually, John Chrysostom, he preached so strongly against sin that that he offended the, the empress. He was summoned before the emperor and in that summons he was threatened with banishment if he did not stop his uncompromising preaching. His response was, Sir, you cannot banish me for the world is my father's house. (laughs) And the emperor responds, Well, well, I'm going to slay you. And his response is, You cannot take my life because my life is hid with Christ in God. He says, Well, I'm going to take your goods. I'm going to confiscate your treasures. And John replied, Sir, you you cannot cannot even have them because my treasures are in heaven where no one can break in and steal. I'm going to drive you away from man and you'll have no friends left. That was his final, that was his, he thought that was his strong point. And John just says, well you can't do that either because I have a friend in heaven and he said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. That man was eventually banished on his way to put in some island on the Black Sea. He died. But none of those things that he said could be taken from him. You see, John Chrysostom knew what lay before him and that enabled him with a right cheerful spirit and a rejoicing in the Lord to be able to face the fiercest of persecution. So friends, when persecution comes our way for being saved by the grace of God, how do we respond? Woe is me. Oh, my life is so hard. That's probably our human, that's my human response. Jesus is never wrong. Is he? Is he ever wrong? Never wrong. And so Jesus' perspective here in this passage, it's right. He's always right. He says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. And so think about this as we finish. Think about this for you and your life, whatever be the circumstance. What hope, what help is there for the Christian wife whose non-Christian husband gives her a hard time for her faith or at least is indifferent towards that. Your reward is great in heaven. Or as a Christian young person, because you are a Christian, you feel like you've got few friends. Great is your reward in heaven. That missionary serving in that dangerous place and hardly anybody knows, knows the name. Great is the reward in heaven.
for those who did not grow up in a Christian family. And they, and they witness. And the response that they always seem, seem to get is indifference, maybe it's abuse, maybe it's rejection. When you're shunned at work because you live by Jesus' standards of righteousness and you want to live for his glory, great will be your reward in heaven. When you are falsely accused and your name becomes mud, great will be your reward. Maybe in your own home, by the grace of God, you, stand, you seek to stand for truth and righteousness. You love Christ and his church and no one else seems to care. They mock, they snicker at you, they belittle you. In heaven, great, all great will be your reward. Here's why Jesus could say, bless, oh, perfectly happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake for theirs is already the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning as your people to give you our praise, our thanks. Lord, gratitude in our hearts to think that you would give to us this precious part of your scriptures, preserve it for us in our language and give us the opportunity in these recent weeks to study these wonderful sayings that are so relevant for our lives. Thank you. Thank you for the light that they give to us, the help that they are to us, the confirmation and assurance they bring to us and comfort and for we who are yours. We pray for those who are not yet in the kingdom. In their conscience even now they know. Lord, we pray, grant them that real sense of love for Christ and acknowledgement that they are totally barren before you that they may look away from themselves and look again to the only one who can deal with their sin, he who is righteous, the Lord Jesus. Bless your word, we ask again, both to save and to sanctify. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.